Hello, and welcome to my first paper summary that I document through this medium. A recent paper aims at studying how well vision transformers can perform when they are able to see the object at different scales. The paper in question is named DIT, Efficient Vision Transformers with Dynamic Token Routing. In many recent digital image processing techniques, every piece or token of an image is expressed in a very fixed manner. This can be problematic because not all objects in a photo are the same. They can be big or small, or some objects can be harder to recognize than others. In their process, they use gates that are a bit like checkpoints. These gates decide how each image piece is processed, allowing the system to handle the image in multiple ways. By doing this, DIT can be more sensitive to the differences in the objects in the image, such as their size or how easy they are to recognize. An added advantage, the researchers also designed DIT to be more efficient by setting certain limits or stopping the process early when it's not needed. Let us try to make the problem simple enough for anyone to understand. Imagine you're looking at a big picture with both an elephant and an ant in it. Now these networks we are talking about have a tough time figuring out things in pictures, especially when the objects are of different sizes, like a huge elephant or a tiny ant. So two problems they face are one object size. Some objects in the picture are big and some are tiny. Just like in our picture, the elephant takes up a lot more space than the ant. This means the computer sees more pieces or tokens of the elephant than the ant. These pieces have different details based on the size of the object. Number two, detail needed. Think of it like this. Recognizing a person in a picture might need more information than recognizing a football. It's like trying to tell apart two nearly identical Lego sets. One might need you to look more closely at tiny details, while the other is easier to identify with just a quick glance. In the past, CNNs and recent transformer networks as well follow a sequential methodology. What does that mean? In simple terms, it means progressively reducing the spatial size of the feature maps. What could go wrong? You guessed it. If the elephant is still recognizable at smaller scale, the poor ant, however, is now only a speck. The paper studies the related works by broadly classifying them into three categories. One, transformer backbones. How PVT or pyramid vision transformers, an important work in the transformer literature, was introduced. Two, multi-scale feature for dense prediction. This goes back to papers like FPN, RetinaNet, and Mask RCNN, and how they depend on the scale of the objects for their performance. And three, dynamic networks. Some CNN architectures as well as dynamic VIT look at token sparsification as an answer, but dynamic token routing is systematically studied through the authors in this paper. Let us put things into perspective and understand related works with our analogy. Imagine you're trying to find a, and label things in this big picture. Now in this picture, some things are really big like elephants and some are really tiny like the ant. First, why multiple scale features are needed? It's like using different magnifying glasses for different items in the picture. A big magnifying glass helps you see small things like ants, while a smaller magnifying glass might be best for the bigger things, like elephants. Secondly, traditional methods. Think of it as using a set of fixed magnifying glass. Each one has its own zoom level. Some methods like RetinaNet and Mask RCNN already do this. They decide which magnifying glass or scale to use based on the size of the thing you're trying to find in the picture. And thirdly, the new idea, 
dynamic scaling networks. Instead of always using the same set of magnifying glasses for every picture, what if you could pick and choose the best ones for each picture? That's the idea here. For each part of the image, the network dynamically selects the best magnifying glass or scale to use. Now imagine you're making a robot sort Lego bricks by size and color. The robot has a special camera. This is our vision transformer that looks at Lego pieces, but sometimes it gets confused when the Lego pieces are very different in size or color. So firstly, what the paper is doing, they're trying to make this robot's camera smarter. They're adding two special features to help it sort better. One to adjust for size, dynamic scaling, and one to adjust for color complexity, dynamic depth. Secondly, Dynamic Vision Transformer, or DIT, is the name for the smarter robot camera. It can adjust how it looks at the Lego bricks on the fly. Think of the grid-like network as a big game board. Each square on the board helps decide how the robot camera should adjust its view. Each square is a decision-making spot, which they call a token routing module. The token routing module is a brainy part of each square on the game board. It decides how to adjust the view for each Lego piece it's looking at. It predicts whether it should zoom in, zoom out, or change the focus based on the Lego's size and color. And finally, the two binary gates. This is like having two switches at each decision-making square. One switch, the vertical path, decides if the robot should zoom in or zoom out for size, and the other switch, horizontal path, decides how to adjust for the Lego block. By doing all this fancy adjusting, the robot camera, or our vision transformer, gets better at recognizing and sorting different Lego pieces by their size and color. But to understand how dynamic token routing works, and not get sucked into a whirlpool of math and architecture, we must keep our analogy at hand. Images are distilled into their features, and these features then are allowed to roam free on a grid-like structure, which is our chessboard. At every node of that grid, our features must choose either of the three ways to move. As they get better at choosing, the network gets better at learning. If you are a DL practitioner, you're already crying, thinking of the shapes of the tensors. The paper is surprisingly detailed and methodical in providing the necessary information. To understand this, imagine you're analyzing a photograph using a microscope. So you most likely would need the following five stages. First, dividing the image. Initially, you take the image and divide it into smaller sections. Think of these as zoomed in areas under your microscope. Each section captures a part of the image. Number two, resolution reduction. Instead of viewing the whole photograph at once, you reduce the clarity by a factor. The H times W times three simply means the image's height, width, and three color channels. Third, token routing space. Think of this as a multi-level laboratory where each level allows you to further analyze and process these segments. At each level, you can reduce the segment size further, making it smaller and simpler to analyze. Number four, progressive downsampling. As you go deeper into these levels, the segments are downsized. By the time you reach the fourth level, your segments are tiny, being only one thirty-tooth of the original starting size. And finally, transformers and stages. Within each level of this lab, you use various tools. These are your vision transformers to process and understand these segments. The term stage here is like a phase or a step in the process. And M denotes how many of these phases you have in a level. But what are these stages or phases? What exactly happens to the tokens at the multi-level laboratory or token routing space? First, imagine you have a chessboard. On every square, there's a tiny lab station or node. Each lab station has a unique response map. 
sort of like a blueprint or a reference guide. The response map is a representation at a specific square IJ on your chessboard. You use this as a map or a starting point to decide what steps to take next. At every square or stage, you have three main tools. First, the patch embedding layer. Think of this as a microscope that looks closely at certain parts of your response map. Second, transformer blocks. These are like tiny robots that process and modify the parts of the response map you're focusing on. Third, identity mapping layer. This is like a reference guide ensuring you remember and use original information from your response map. When working on a square, you combine or mix information from the current square and also possibly from the neighboring squares. You might look left, which is i, j minus 1, or up, which is i minus 1, j, on the chessboard to borrow information. The process of deciding where to get information from and how much to mix is based on a strategy called routing. Now, sometimes you don't need to use all the tools. Depending on your strategy, you might skip some tools on certain squares. When you skip, you put a mask on the response map, sort of like putting a do not touch sign on certain parts. A diagram is great, but at some point, we need to come in terms with the math. Before we do that, let us come back to a simpler analogy to realize what steps we must take to formulate the equations. So firstly, self-dependent token routing. Imagine again, you have a bunch of little robots called tokens traveling on paths on your map, your chessboard network. Each robot looks at its own features, sort of like its own specifications or tools is carrying and decides which path it should take. Decision gates. Now there are special checkpoints, binary gates in the network that help choose the robots, their path. These checkpoints are present at every transformer stage and patch embedding module. Making the decision with a mask. At each checkpoint or transformer stage, there's a decision mask, which is kind of like a traffic light system. It can either show a green light, one, or a red light, zero for each robot, indicating whether or not it should proceed or stop. And finally, the default setting in the beginning, every traffic light is set to green, meaning every element in the decision mask is one, allowing all robots to move freely. However, we don't want all the robots in, to go in the same direction or use the same path. So we use a specific mechanism, a linear projection that looks at the robot's feature and the entire map scenario to decide which traffic lights should change from green to red or vice versa. So we need a learnable parameter that can tune which gate to open. This means we are deciding whether or not to study the image and look for features using our special lab, the transformer block. We need to predict the probability map based on the feature. The equation is shown here. W rho ij is a linear projection here. The probability map cannot be left continuous since the aim is to do specific routing. Tokens are discrete in nature. So Gumba softmax is used to sample the binary decision mass from the above probability map. The linear projection distribution W rho ij is formulated as a moving average to maintain a stable gating module for the transformer blocks, W row IJ are updated during back propagation. The above equations were for the row axis of our grid structure, we, but we also need the column axis. This means formulating the learnable parameter which understands which gates to open for the downsampling zooming in module. This means a smaller object's feature which will be stopped at the beginning of the grid so that the ant doesn't become a speck while the bigger object's elephant's feature will be downsampled further. Thus, for the downsampling or patch embedding layer, we have a similar linear projection, W call IJ, that is maintained using a moving average, the same as the row parameter. This is also updated using back propagation, 
the column probability distribution and Gumbel softmax are similarly expressed in this equation. At this stage, we should also recap how these equations align with our rudimentary grid-like structure. The actual equation governing the entire gating mechanism is such. The authors also devised a complexity constraint to have a trade-off between effectiveness and complexity. Essentially, they formulate a cost with respect to flops for each stage, transformers, and patch embedding. They name this cost C space. Also, cal they calculate the cost for PV2, V2, which is a pyramid vision transformer architecture that they baseline and are improving this on and name it C base. They create a loss function as a combination of C base and C space. Add that loss to the overall loss function of the whole network and jointly optimize it during training. The authors conduct experiments for three task levels. Image classification on ImageNet 1K, object detection and image segmentation and semantic segmentation. The authors report a SOTA with comparison against G-flops against all three of these tasks. The authors also report an ablation study where they study the effect of not skipping any gate, fully connected grid. They report only a slight increase in improvement. They also study random and attention augmented mass generation as opposed to learnable mass generation used by their strategy. They reported that their strategy was superior in accuracy. The authors leave us with the idea that our models must be accommodating to the needs of the data. We must not aim or settle for one bill fits all architecture, but rather strive to find models that serve the smallest regions of the image with the same dexterity that they serve the largest ones with. It is their belief that dynamic token routing can be applied to monolithic vision transformers as well as language domains.